All right, first things first. Last time we talked about federalism, the relationship between the state governments and the national government. We talked about how that relationship has evolved uh, from their responsibilities and powers and authority being distinct from one another, being separated from one another, through old federalism, layer cake federalism too. What we have now, where a lot of those responsibilities, a lot of those authorities are now mixed together, and we don't know who controls what, or who's responsible for what, marble cake or cooperative federalism today. All right, today we're going to start out with probably the most important addition to the U.S. Constitution as far as this class is concerned anyway, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. The 14th Amendment was added after the Civil War. Um, this is going to redefine this relationship it's going to redefine federalism um, in the United States. Before the 14th Amendment, you should know two things are true. Before the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was added to the U.S. Constitution, according to the Supreme Court, the Bill of Rights that we talked about in this class, the first 10 amendments, only limited the national government, only limited the U.S. government. It did not limit the state governments. So I talked about the Bill of Rights in this class acting like a shield. The Bill of Rights lists the liberties that government is not supposed to take away from you. But according to the Supreme Court, before the 14th Amendment was added, the shield only protected you against the national government. However, it did not protect you against the state government. If a state government wanted to, it can take away or violate any of these liberties according to the Supreme Court of the United States because the Bill of Rights was only meant to protect you from the national government. It did not mean to protect you from the state governments. You know, I'm good so far. Another thing that states were able to do before the 14th Amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution is discriminate. State governments are responsible for a lot of important policy areas including education and elections. And they've been able to use that power to deny certain people rights and privileges that other people have. They deny women the right to vote, for example, in education. And it's also the same thing for African Americans for a very long time. Now, the 14th Amendment is added to the Constitution after the Civil War. And the 14th Amendment gives us two of the most important clauses in the U.S. Constitution. Let's read along with me. No state, it refers to no government either the U.S. or the state governments. State just means government. No government shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. From that sentence, we get two of the most important clauses in this class, the due process clause and the equal protection clause. For today, Here's all you need to remember about these two clauses and what, how does it limit the state governments today. Number one, the due process clause applies the Bill of Rights to the state governments. It applies the Bill of Rights to the state governments. Which means today, through the due process clause, the protections of liberties that are in your Bill of Rights not only protects you against the national government, those liberties are also protected against the state governments through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. So this shield is even stronger today because not only does it protect you from the national government, it protects you from the state governments today as well. That's what a due process clause, in a nutshell, that's what it does. Going good so far. The next one, very important for most of us here, minorities, women, people who have different sexual orientations and, and gender and religion, the Equal Protection Clause prohibits any government, specifically the states, from discriminating on the basis of gender, religion, race, sexual orientation or preferences. No government discrimination. So today, if Texas makes a policy that you believe is discriminatory, against some uh, certain people of color, against a certain race, a certain gender or sexual orientation, they would be in violation of the Equal Protection Clause and prohibits state sanctioned discrimination. And believe it or not, even though discrimination is not going to end with the addition of the 14th Amendment, the 
14th Amendment, time and time again, will be used by the courts to protect people from discrimination from their government. It's the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause that was used to legalize same-sex marriages in the United States. It was used to make abortion legal in Roe versus Wade. This is one of the most important clauses in the U.S. Constitution when it comes to equality, when it comes to protecting us from government discrimination. Any questions, guys? So, here's a question. When it comes to federalism, which is the relationship between the states and the U.S. government, which government became significantly more limited because of the addition of the 14th Amendment? The state governments. The state government's power became very limited because of this addition of the 14th Amendment. Now, the Bill of Rights applies to them, so they can make policies that violate the Bill of Rights. Now, they have to be careful about their policies discriminating against people of color, women. But not only that, guys, not only does it limit the state government's authority, it actually expands the federal government's authority. Why? Because someone's going to have to hold the states accountable for violating their liberties. Someone's going to have to hold the states accountable for discriminating. And the only one that can do that today is the national government. Here's a question. Which part of the national government today holds state governments accountable for violating your liberties or discriminating against people? Which of the three branches is the most responsible for holding state governments today accountable? The judicial branch. The judicial branch. Whenever Texas passes a law that might be against the Bill of Rights or might be discriminatory, the judicial branch can come in and say, hey, that law is unconstitutional. It violates these two clauses of the 14th Amendment. So the judicial branch is especially important in holding state governments accountable today. Does that make sense for everybody? Anyone confused by that? So again, this redefined this relationship, making the U.S. government more powerful and limiting state power today. All right, today we're going to talk about a concept, a relatively new concept, but it's not really. They just gave it a name, but this is something that a lot of people in the United States, ever since the days of the Anti-Federalists, have advocated for, devolution. What's the theme of U.S. history? For 200 years that we've come into existence, which of our governments have gotten more powerful? The national government. The national government today is more powerful than it's ever been before. For 200 years of American history, it's gained more power, more influence, and it has influenced the state governments more and more. Today, a national government would probably be something unrecognizable, even to the Federalists like Hamilton and Madison, who wanted more support, more national power. They probably would think today that the national government have too much power. So there's a movement in the United States today that's advocating to reverse that trend. Instead of the U.S. government becoming more powerful, the U.S. government should give up that power to the state governments, should give back some of the powers that the state governments have lost over the years back to the state governments. This is a movement called devolution, also known as new federalism. This one's simple. This is the transfer of power or the responsibilities, authority, whatever you want to put there. Transfer of authority, power, from the national government back to the state governments, where some people today feel it rightfully belongs. So the transfer of power and authority from the national to the state governments. Some people call this today new federalism. This is something that was picked up by one of our major parties, and this is one of the things that they're advocating for today. So if you want to know the difference between Democrats and Republicans, it's still the same issue that the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists were fighting about 200 years ago, state power and national power. Today, devolution is something that's championed by which of our major parties? The right. The Republicans. The Republicans. The right, the conservatives of the United States, the Republicans. So this year, if you vote Republican, you should know that you're voting for devolution. You're voting for state governments gaining back some of the powers and authorities that some people think that they've lost over the years. Any questions so far, guys? This was something that Republicans took up in the 1980s during Ronald Reagan's administration. They call it new federalism, a new kind of relationship. Instead of a state government bending over backwards for the national government, it should be the other way around, according to some Republicans. Any questions, guys? So, today, what does devolution look 
like in practice. So let's like, take a look at some examples of devolution. Last time, I talked about the use of federal grants, federal money in order to influence the states. And there's two types, categorical and, bro and block grants. Categorical is money given to the states for a specific purpose. The states don't have a choice but to spend the money according to what the national government wants it to be spent on. What's the other type of grant again? Block grants. I told you block grants, state governments like. They love block grants because it's money given to them for a what? For a broader purpose. The US government is not telling them exactly what to do with the money. The thing that they hate about grants in general is that the money comes with federal policy. They have to adopt that federal policy. They have to take in federal authority. Well, block grants is basically money without a lot of federal authority. Does that make sense? So Republicans today, they advocate for more block grants because they feel like this gives the, 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 the state governments more power, more authority, more choices on how they can solve their own problems with federal money. Make sense so far? Now, another way that we can do devolution is through the use of revenue sharing. Revenue sharing is even simpler. Revenue sharing is just the U.S. government giving money with no strings attached. They're sharing their revenue with the taxes that the U.S. government collect. All the revenue sharing is is the U.S. government giving the states money without anything, without a mandate, without telling them what to do with the money, even for a broad purpose. It's just the U.S. government giving away money to the state government and allowing them to use the money however they see fit. So, something that you need to remember is revenue sharing today does not happen anymore. They stopped using revenue sharing in the 1970s. Um, I think they declared it illegal, actually. So this is not something that has happened anymore. But if you're a Republican, this is something you want to want to bring back. Any questions so far? And then, the use of one of the amendments in the Bill of Rights, the 10th Amendment, sometimes, Whenever the U.S. government tries to encroach upon things that belong to the states, the, the courts of the United States protect state power with the use of the Tenth Amendment. What does the Tenth Amendment say? That there are powers reserved to whom only the state government. So the Tenth Amendment today can be used by the courts to protect state power. That's devolution. Telling the national government, hands off. This doesn't belong to you. So the courts can do that. So more conservative courts, they do that often. They tell the national government, hands off, this belongs to the states. Allow the states to control this. This belongs to them. That's what happened with the abortion case um, this past summer. It's the courts basically telling the national government, allow the state governments to make their own decisions regarding abortion. That's devolution. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's up to you. And a specific example of devolution is what happened in the 1990s with entitlements and welfare programs. If you don't know, and you need to know this, welfare or entitlement programs are government benefits. Government benefits. So if you want a definition, you need to remember it from now on. Entitlement programs or welfare programs are government benefits. They're government programs that benefit people, especially the needy of the United States. Can anybody give me some examples of government Entitlement programs, food stamps, food stamps, uh, stamps would be one. Yeah. What else? Uh, housing. Sorry? Housing? Mm -hmm. Handicap? SSI. S Social Security? Yes, yeah, Social Security. Social Security is like a pension given to your grandparents because they don't work anymore uh -huh. by the government. Medicare, yeah. Medicaid, free health care for people who are older, free health care for poor people in the United States. That's also an entitlement program. Unemployment benefits, if your parents ever get fired, the, the government gives them a little bit of money to sustain them for a couple of months. That's also welfare. Somebody mentioned housing for poor people. That's a welfare entitlement program. Those of you that have moms that recently gave birth to your, your siblings, they can take advantage of a government program called WIC, where the government gives them provisions like milk and diapers and stuff like that um, for the mom and for the baby as well. Now we go so far. Before this law, passed in the 1990s, most of the responsibility of running these programs um, 
was under the control, they were under the control of the national government. So the national government ran most of these programs, these welfare programs. In the 1990s, the Bill Clinton administration and Republicans in Congress, they decided to perform devolution. They decided to give some of that power and responsibilities to the state governments, allow the state governments, because they know their people better, they know what the problems their states are facing better, to run most of the welfare programs in the United States. So this law allowed state governments to run most of the welfare programs in the United States. So WIC, food stamps, housing, all these today are provided for you by the state governments. These programs today are ran by the state governments, not by the national government. The national government kept the big ones though. The national government still controls Social Security, it still controls Medicare, but most other welfare programs that's run today by the state governments. Can anybody tell me what that means? If state governments today run wealth, most of the welfare programs, what does it mean for these welfare programs? Like, are they still getting the same amount of funding? Huh? Are they still getting the same amount of funding if, it's, if they're responsible for it? What's the answer? I'm getting yes, no. no. Which means they're going to need less. So spending. you're both correct, right? The amount of money they spend on these welfare programs are going to be different. Some states are going to be stingy with their benefits. Some states are going to be very generous with their benefits. The eligibility in order to qualify for these programs are going to be different as well. Some states will have strict eligibility. Some states are going to have very loose eligibility. You live in one of those states that's very conservative, so we're kind of stingy with our welfare programs. As opposed to states like California and Vermont, where they're more generous with what they give people that need it. Does that make sense? So the benefits, the amount of money being spent on these programs today is going to be different per state. Just like with education, the quality, the services are going to be diverse. Whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, again, that's something that you have to struggle with when you're growing up. Any questions about devolution? All right. So let's talk about federalism today. You should know that debates about state power, like I always tell you, and national power has not stopped. This is something that we still talk about today. Republicans and Democrats are, are each other's throats in government today, partly because of this age-old debate. Who should be able to control which area? Should it be the state's responsibility? Should it be the national government's responsibility? It's like the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists haven't stopped. This is, more, not, this is very evident when it comes to education. You should know, because you've been in education, in public government provided education for 12 years now, the education system in the United States is broken. We spend a lot of money for quality that's not up to par with countries like those in Europe where they provide good quality education. And the biggest debate over education today is we know we have a problem. Who should handle it? Traditionally, education is mostly the responsibility of who? The state governments, state and local governments handle education. There's some people in the United States today that are advocating for allowing the U.S. government more control, allowing the U.S. government to take the reins. In other countries like France and Germany, where they have one government making educational policy, education is the same everywhere. You don't have to shop around which districts are the best districts because the education quality across the country is the same because there's one government making the policy. If you're a Republican, though, Right? How would you argue against that? How would you argue against one government controlling education? Republicans, they would say, yeah, it would be the same, but it would be the same crappy quality. If we allow the U.S. government to run education, it's not going to be very good. The states know their students better. They know the problems of their students better than the national government can, so they should be the one handling it. So, as you're growing up, again, this is something that you have to struggle with, especially when it comes to your kids' education someday. Who should you want to take control? Should it be the state and local government's responsibility, or should it be the national government's responsibility? We see this tug, uh, this tug of war back and forth with two mandates that were given by the national government in the 2000s. In 2001, the Bush administration passed a mandate called No Child Left Behind. Uh, it required the states to institute regular 
standardized testing. When I was growing up, like I told you, it was called tax. When you guys were growing up, it was called STAR or EOC. But this was a mandate given by the national government to try to improve student achievement in the United States. Ask your older siblings. The tests used to be more regular. You used to have one test uh, per class every single year. So if you're going to test in all of your core classes every single year. Math, science, English, and history every single year. So you'll, you'll have four exams every single year, four EOCs every single year. But then in 2015, the Obama administration passed another mandate called Every Student Succeeds Act. What it did is it allowed the states to control how regular the testing will be. We're still going to have testing, right? The U.S. government is still mandating testing. That's why we still have testing today. But those states will be allowed to control how regular that testing is. The state of Texas chose to have it like one test, one or two tests every single year. But which year did you guys have the most exams on? Maybe eighth grade? We had like four, but that's not really a big deal. Um, but the responsibility was given to the state governments to decide how regular that testing will be. It's not as frequent as it used to be under No Child Left Behind. What is this called? That's devolution, right? The U.S. government got some control with No Child Left Behind, and then it gave back some to the state governments with the Every Student Succeeds Act. Does that make sense for everybody? All right, we'll go to the next notes. Go ahead and take those out. In AP government, you are responsible for knowing two landmark Supreme Court, sorry, not two, 15 landmark Supreme Court cases. Um, you need to know the facts of each case, you need to know what the Supreme Court is actually deciding in each case, and you need to know the impact of that case um, on America today. So today we're going to talk about two cases involving federalism, the relationship between the states and the national government. McCulloch versus Maryland, one of our oldest cases, 20 years ago, and one of our newest cases, U.S. versus Lopez, which tackles something that we still deal with today. But today, we're going to talk about McCulloch versus Maryland. McCulloch versus Maryland is about these. I told you before, the U.S. Constitution gives power to the U.S. government. They're known as delegated powers, but they come in two forms enumerated and implied. Enumerated are those specifically written down where? In the Constitution. That's what they're called enumerated. Enumerated means listed. They're listed in the U.S. Constitution. Implied powers are not specifically written down in the Constitution. They're just implied by their enumerated powers. What did I tell you? What sentence of the U.S. Constitution justifies implied powers? The fact that the U.S. government today can claim to have powers that are not specifically written down. What's the little sentence called? Yes. Oh, very good. The government shall make any law which are necessary and proper. It's called the necessary and proper clause. It justifies implied powers. You want to go with me so far? Today, that's not a question. Today, we know the U.S. government can do that. The U.S. government has powers that are not specifically written down. No one really questions that today. But imagine 200 years ago. something that was up for debate. The question is, does the U.S. government strictly have the powers that are mentioned specifically in the U.S. Constitution, or does it have powers that go beyond those specifically written down in the Constitution? The question that this case tackles is, are implied powers a real thing? Should the government be restricted with what it says in the U.S. Constitution specifically, or does it have powers that go beyond what it says? Alright, yeah, everyone go with me so far. Anyone have any questions about implied powers? McCulloch versus Maryland goes like this. Alexander Hamilton established the Bank of the United States using implied powers. Alexander Hamilton was the Secretary of Treasury. You don't need to know this detail, by the way. I'll tell you what you need to know. But when Alexander Hamilton was head of the Treasury Department of the United States, he wanted to establish a bank, a national bank, a national central national bank. 
So he goes to the US government, to Congress, and he tells Congress, Congress, I need a bank. Make me a law, establish a bank. This is how we're going to fix this broken economy left behind by the Articles of Confederation. The US government tells him, we would like to help you, Hamilton, but the power or the ability to create a national bank is not written where? In the Constitution. In the Constitution. It's not one of our enumerated powers. We can't help you. Hamilton tells him, hey, I helped write the Constitution. I know what it says. You can do this for me. All you have to say is, the bank is what? Necessary and proper. Hey, you have the power to tax. You gotta put that money somewhere. You have, to, you have the power to print money. You have the power to borrow money. In order to do these things properly, a, na a national bank is necessary and proper. Does that make sense? But the point is, this is what you need to remember, the US government created the Bank of the United States using this implied powers doctrine, using implied powers. It's not specifically written down in the Constitution, but they use the necessary and proper clause in order to establish a bank. I'm good so far? Years go by, and you should know that the Bank of the United States for a lot of state governments back then was a symbol of the U.S. government becoming tyrannical. It's a symbol of the U.S. government claiming to have powers that it doesn't actually have. A lot of state governments hated the Bank of the United States, including the state of Maryland, which happened to be the state where the National Bank was built. Come with me so far. So Maryland hates the bank because they don't believe the Bank of the United States should even exist in the first place because it's not written down in the Constitution that the U.S. government can do it. So here's what Maryland decided to do. It decided to tax the Bank of the United States. Tax it so much that it won't have a choice but to close down. So the state of Maryland attempted to tax the Bank of the United States. Maryland attempted to tax the Bank of the United States. So these are the two facts you need to remember from the case. Number one, national government, a national bank was built using implied powers, right? It's not specifically in the Constitution, but the U.S. government believed that it was necessary and proper. Number two, the state of Maryland attempted to tax the Bank of the United States with the intention of killing the bank. Now, go with me so far. So here's the questions the Supreme Court has to answer. So this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. McCulloch was the guy who was running the National Bank of the United States. He refused to pay Maryland's taxes. That's why we have a case, McCulloch versus Maryland. The Supreme Court has to answer two questions. The first question the Supreme Court has to answer is, did the US government have the right to build the bank in the first place? Does the US Constitution give the national government the ability to do things that are not specifically written down in the U.S. Constitution? Does the Necessary and Proper Clause actually allow for implied powers? In other words, are implied powers real? Number two, if, it is, if they are real, if the national government does have the ability to create a bank, can a state like Maryland tax the Bank of the United States? So let's tackle the first question. What do you think they decided? Are implied powers still used today? Yes. Yes. So the Supreme Court decided in this case that yes, indeed, implied powers are real. The necessary and proper clause allows the U.S. government to do things that are not specifically written down in the Constitution of the United States. So even today, like what Brutus was afraid of, the necessary and proper clause is being used by the U.S. government today to claim to be able to do things that are not specifically written down, as long as it's necessary and proper to do their enumerated powers. Make sense so far? So does the bank have the right to exist? Yes. So the second question is, can Maryland tax them? You should know the answer to this already, because we've talked about it already. They said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. If entity A can tax entity B, it means entity A can destroy Entity B. Which means, if Maryland is allowed to tax the federal government, which is what the National Bank is, what can Maryland do to the federal government? Destroy it. Can that happen? How do you know that can happen? Because it has the right to exist, and the federal law supersedes the states. Very good. 
Article 6 of the U.S. Constitution tells us that whose power is supposed to be supreme? Federal authority. Federal authority is supreme over state authority. The supremacy clause. So, if they allow Maryland to tax the Bank of the United States, it would mean state power supersedes national power, which is not true. It's false. It's the other way around. So, can Maryland tax the Bank of the United States? No. No, it can't. Does that make sense? So, with the second question, the Supreme Court said no, because national power supersedes or supreme to state power under the Supremacy Clause. What Maryland did is violated national supremacy. Question. In both accounts, who won this case? The federal government. The federal government. The federal government won both accounts. Number one, they got the Supreme Court to confirm that implied powers are a real thing. Now they have the court's permission to do things that are not specifically written down in the Constitution. It's not a debate anymore. This settled the debate. That's why we don't talk about whether or not the U.S. government can do things that are outside of what the Constitution is, uh, is, was written in the Constitution. And number two, it affirmed that which government is supposed to be supreme? The national or federal government. So this was a huge victory for the national government through and through. It's going to redefine this relationship. Next case. One of our newest cases. I was alive during this case. 1995, United States versus Lopez. In 1995, just like what's happening right now, the United States have a problem that not a lot of other countries have. School shootings. It's still happening, it was happening back then, it's still happening now, right? So, the U.S. government tried to do something about it. Congress passed a law. It's called the Gun-Free School Zone Act. Now, when they ask you to provide the facts of this case, they just mean, describe what happened, right? What's going on in this case? If you don't remember details like the name of this law, Gun-Free School Zone Act, just describe what it does. They're still going to count it right. So, what the Gun-Free School Zone Act says is, it's going to ban guns within the school zone, within a school zone. It would be illegal under federal law for somebody to bring guns inside of a school zone. Any questions so far? All right, so here's what happened in the case. This happened in Texas, of course it did. But this happened here. Lopez was somebody who violated the law. He brought a gun. I don't know if he was a student. I believe he was a student. He brought a gun into a school zone. He gets arrested because he violated this law. What's the problem? I want you to imagine this. I want you to imagine that you're a lawyer representing Lopez. You're defending Lopez in this case. There's no doubt that he violated the law. You can't argue that he didn't violate the law. Everybody saw him bring the gun. That's not how you tackle this case. He violated the law. So what's your approach? You don't question whether or not he violated the law. You question the law itself, the validity of the law itself. This law affects two areas, right? Education would be one. Another one would be policing. Two policy areas that's supposed to be traditionally reserved to whom? The state governments. So you argue that the US government did not have the power, the right, to pass this law in the first place. This law is unconstitutional because education and policing belongs to the state governments, not the national government. If the Texas government wants to prosecute Lopez, fine. But no, this is the U.S. government. And it's meddling in policy areas that it's not supposed to meddle with. These are areas that are reserved to the state governments. Make sense? So, Police powers and education are policy areas that belong to the state governments. That's the problem here. Here's what the U.S. government says. And I want you to notice the argument and how convincing you think the argument is, right? They said that gun violence as a result of guns, right? usually lead to 
property values in that neighborhood where gun violence is a common thing to go down. So in neighborhoods where there's a lot of gun violence, property values go down. And in neighborhoods that have gun violence, their students don't achieve as well as those students in um, peaceful neighborhoods. So they don't graduate as much as, as those in peaceful neighborhoods. They don't become professionals as much as those in peaceful neighborhoods. Which means that gun violence has an impact on what? What did I tell you? Whenever the U.S. government tries to control the state, it often uses what we call the Commerce Clause or the Interstate Commerce Clause. This has an impact on interstate commerce, economic activity between states. Therefore, according to the U.S. government, we can control it. Because this thing, this act, which is guns in schools, has an impact on interstate commerce. Make sense? You see how flimsy the reasoning is, though? How much of a stretch the US government is making here? But here's the thing. The US government has reason to be confident here. Because it's been 200 years since the US, the US Constitution was ratified. And throughout those 200 years between McCulloch and now Lopez, the US government has been allowed to use the Commerce Clause to get away with things like this. The US government has been allowed by the Supreme Court to use the Commerce Clause to claim to have authority over activities that, that, are, that are not only interstate commerce, but activities that have impact on interstate commerce, that affects interstate commerce. So they're confident coming into this case because they've gotten away with it. Ye case after case after case, the Supreme Court has sided with the US government whenever they try to use the Commerce Clause to justify claiming to have authority over things that happens in the states. All they have to say is, hey, this thing that we want to control, it has an impact on interstate commerce, so we can control it. Make sense? Anyone, have, anyone confused so far? All right, so what does the Supreme Court have to decide in this case? There's two questions the Supreme Court, oh, there's one question the Supreme Court has to answer. Number one, is this an overextension of the Commerce Clause? Is this an overextension of the, of the federal government's power under the Commerce Clause? Are they using the Commerce Clause wrongly? Are they claiming to have more power than they actually should, justifying it with the Commerce Clause, right? Is this an overextension of the U.S. government's authority under the Commerce Clause? That's the question here. Remember, in past cases, the court has ruled in favor of the U.S. government whenever they try to use the Commerce Clause to get what they want. But this is why U.S. versus Lopez is talked about in this class because this is the first time in 200 years where the Supreme Court is going to put a limit on how the Commerce Clause can be used by the, by the U.S. government, by the federal government. This is why this case is important. When before, they were allowed to use it whenever they want, however they want. This case is going to put a limit on that. The decision says, if the U.S. government wants to use the Commerce Clause to control an activity, they have to prove that it has a significant impact on interstate commerce. The word there is significant. Not just an impact, it has to have significant impact. Absent of that proof, they're not going to be able to use the Commerce Clause to claim to have authority over that activity. They need to prove that it has significant impact on interstate commerce. That's the limit there. That's the limit established by this case. I need you to remember the word significant. You can put substantial. It has to have substantial impact on interstate commerce. Not just an impact, substantial. Here's what the Supreme Court says. If we allow the U.S. government to get away with this case, to get away with it in this case, and just be able to control things that have impact on interstate commerce, what activity doesn't have impact on interstate commerce, guys? What activity that you can think of doesn't impact interstate commerce? That's why almost everything has some impact on interstate commerce. That's what the court is saying. It means if they allow the U.S. government to get away with this in this case, it means the U.S. government can control anything that they want. Because any activity, you can reason, has some impact on interstate commerce. 
But today, there's a limit. It has to have what kind of an impact? Significant. It has to have substantial impact so that the U.S. government can claim to have authority over it under the Commerce Clause. So not just have some impact, it needs to have significant impact. Okay? And another, another thing that's good about this for the state governments is it protected their power. It reaffirmed, hey, this is not a unitary government with one government um, controlling everything. We have federalism. We have a Tenth Amendment. There are powers, there are responsibilities that are reserved to whom? The state governments. So, reserve powers to the states. So what is the impact of this? The most important one, guys, is it reversed the trend. It set a limit on the federal use of the Commerce Clause. The federal use of the Commerce Clause. That's an important thing here. They have to prove that it has significant impact, not just an impact on interstate commerce. It reaffirmed federalism, that there are powers reserved to the state governments, like policing and education. Those belong to the state. The U.S. government should have meddled with those areas. All right, so in this case, you need to know the clauses of the Constitution involved to justify the decision. So there's two clauses in each case. In McCulloch versus Maryland, we have the Necessary and Proper Clause, which they use to justify implied powers, and we have the Supremacy Clause, which they use to stop Maryland from taxing. In this case, we also have two. What are the two? Obviously, this involves which clause of the Constitution? Commerce. The Commerce Clause, right? And what's the other one? What do they use to protect power, the powers of the states to police and to provide for education? The Tenth Amendment, that there are powers reserved to the states. Any questions, guys? So, uh, the United U.S. versus Lopez is to make the Commerce Clause? Yes, sir. Sorry. Whose victory is U.S. versus Lopez? State or national? State, state. state victory, yes. Congress is trade. Trade. Um, today, it's basically economic activity, right? Business activity. It doesn't have to be trade itself. All right. Um, before we end, we're going to end tomorrow the last couple of things. You should know that on Friday, we're going to be testing Unit 1, which is everything that we've covered so far. i got to admit, guys, it's a lot. That's why today, tonight, and tomorrow night, and the next night, you're not going to have any homework assignments. What I want you to focus in on is review. How do you review? On your Google Classroom, I provided you with everything that you need. The notes, which are not just the notes that you're filling out, these are the completed notes. They have all the information that you need from lessons one through nine. And review videos are over here also. Now, you don't have to watch all of these. Ignore mine. They're not as good as the other guys, so if you don't, don't, don't watch these. Watch this, guys. The first two are like summaries. So after you're done studying, maybe you want to take a look at that. But this is where he gets into more detail. It also goes into detail about documents that you need to know. Declaration of Independence, Curtis One, Fed 10. I know some of you are having problems with the document. Fed 51. It's all on. And the two cases that we just went over, McCulloch versus Maryland and U.S. versus Lopez. If you didn't understand what I just taught you guys today, that's fine. Refer to these. Okay? Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. What is the format of the test? Multiple choice, and I'll give you a, a few FRT questions. All right, the paper. Hopefully, most of you got some. If not, grab one in a little bit. When you're reviewing, hopefully you start tonight, so you don't have to review everything Thursday night. Cram everything Thursday night. When you're reviewing and you decide to write down notes. You can write them down on that sheet of paper that I gave you. If you don't have one, I'll give you one in a little bit. Anything that you put on here, you can use on your exam. If you, don't, if you remember everything right away, some of you are like that, then you don't need to use this, right? But those of you that do, and you're able to remember things better when you're writing things down, you're basically creating your own cheat sheet. But you can only use this one page. Make sense? Okay, so when you're studying tonight and tomorrow, oh, by the way, I'm not, I'm collecting these Thursday. Beginning of class, you 
You better have notes on here if you want to use notes because I'm collecting them Thursday. I'll allow you to allow you use them the next day. Someone had a question. Also, please come in with your binders because here's what I have. A few limited copies, about 32 colored ones, and the rest will be black and white of these completed notes. Because I know some of you don't like studying online because you get distracted. I get distracted when I study online. So I have hard copies for you all. And I have 30, the first 30 to ask for some. We'll get the colored ones. You can write on these because these are going to be your copies. Um, from units one to five that we're going to be covering in this class. If you already have your two-inch binder, I'll give I can give you some right now. Can you keep the binder here? Yes, you may. You can keep it at home as well. Okay. I'd rather you keep it at home because that's where you oh, study. Sorry. Yeah. No, you can keep it here also. I don't mind. You want one, Oliver?